if we mix uh, two different sources of data, one from the US and from one from, for example, Europe, and the system that's receiving the data expects data to be formatted in the day, month, year way, it'll detect the US records as problematic. And it will either produce an error or ignore that record so we will lose, lose information. That will happen if the day value is larger than 12 because the system is receiving that in the month field and there cannot be months higher than 12. But what happens if we have a date like this third one? If it comes from a merged data set where there are records from the US and Europe, how do we know if this represents the 4th of February or the 2nd of April? This is obviously an issue for the usability of the records. There's a way of thinking that says that records should be kept hidden, so to speak, um, away from the main corpus of available biodiversity data, at least until they have been fully validated and they are known to be good. But how sure can we be that a record is completely error-free or, or a record set is completely error-free? Some of the issues are easily detectable, but some others are way trickier. However, there's another way of thinking that says that all records should be made available or visible regardless of their status. That doesn't mean that we have to assume that records are right. The, what this means is that if we put records out there so that pe people can see them, if enough people are looking at, the, at this, it will be easier to detect problems. I have found that most of the times it's precisely the merging between good and bad record sets what makes these issues to be detectable. There are many types of errors and issues that cannot be found except by comparing the wrong records with a group of good records. And here's where visualizations play a major role. If we represent together good and bad records in a proper way, bad records will stand out of the main body of correct records, just like outliers do. The important thing is then to find the right visualization for the right situation. Okay, now that we know what visualizations are and how useful they can be, I'll show you a set of visualizations I have found to be pretty useful. I have structured this part of the presentation according to the types of data they are applied to. So we will first explore visualizations related to the geospatial aspect of the biodiversity records. Then I'll move on to graphically representing time and time-related issues. And last in this section, a tool to visualize taxonomic information and relationships. Besides, uh, for each of the visualizations, I'll show you how we have built them, with what program, and yeah, basically how to build them. So let's begin with geospatial visualizations. The most common way of representing spatial information is using a map. Just plotting our data on a map can give us a lot of information. See, for example, this map. In this map, I have plotted the mammal records from Kenya. I didn't pay attention to the coordinates of the records. I was just paying attention to a different field which specifies from which country are those records, where, are the, where have they been found. And. Um, just by looking at the map, we can find several things here. There are three relatively easily detectable issues with the, within these records. The first two are probably among the first things to notice when we look at the map. These vertical and horizontal lines here. They represent right latitudes and wrong longitudes, or the other way around. So for example, in this case, in the case of the vertical line, the longitude values are right. But the, but the latitudes are definitely not. The third one is a bit trickier, and it has to do with this lump of records here. If you see, these records are mostly scattered, but these ones here, they make this strange lump. It might not seem evident at first glance, but if we measure the distance between the lump and the prime meridian, which is around here, that's the same distance as the one from the prime meridian to Kenya. So what can we extract from here? Well, probably 
the, the values for longitude among these records have been negated. The sign has changed. Instead of putting, for example, 36 degrees, they put minus 36 degrees. In this map, um, east is represented by uh, um, positive value, positive longitude values, and west is represented by negative longitude values. So in this case, this record should have plus 36 degrees, and there will probably, if we look at them, they will probably have minus 36. There's a fourth problem here with these records, but it can be better seen with a different type of map. A map that I like more than this one, at least when visualizing occurrence data. And it's the occurrence density map. In this type of map, instead of just representing the location of a point, we use a color gradient to indicate how many records are there with, with those coordinates. It might seem simple, but only by adding this third dimension, we can see a whole new world of information. This is the same example as before, the mammals of Kenya. But this time, we have added a color gradient representing the density of records for each combination of latitude and longitude. With this map, we can detect the fourth issue I talked about earlier. Um, here, colors, as I said, colors represent the density of points, and they go from, on a scale from yellow to red, yellow meaning in that point there are between one and nine records, and in red there are more than 100,000 records. So if we see the records that are scattered around here, they all belong to the lowest category. They're probably just, there's probably just one record here, and there's just probably just one record here. But if we look here in this part of the map, I will zoom in a little bit, there's one point that is colored as the second category. And the information of this map says that there are 82 occurrences within this area. So probably in these two here are just single records, while the other 80 are represented here. What happened here, more, most probably, is that um, this is a, well. This is the location where both latitude and longitude are zero, and it shows that a lot of records have zero in these fields instead of probably leaving empty. These records are probably not intended to be represented in this way. The the original records will probably have no coordinate information, but. This happens when, for example, these records have been processed by a data management system that requires coordinates to be filled, so that the system puts zeros instead of leaving the fields empty, or they are ingested in a database that puts automatically zero in fields that are empty. In this, in this collection, zero zero would mean no records here, but zero zero is a real place on Earth, and here's where the issue appears. See, for example, this other map of the Iberian Peninsula. The distribution of points shows that the whole peninsula is quite well sampled. Maybe Spain a bit a, a bit better sampled than Portugal. But if we add the color, we begin to see a different pattern. Uh, here, the color goes from darker, meaning less records, to lighter, meaning more records. And white represents a lot of records for that particular point. If we see there's a uniform grid of white points, of high density points. In this case, this, this grid represents points from a single collection of records. And the coordinates for these points have no decimal figures. This is probably because the original intention of the collection was not to give high precision coordinates, but probably to show presences or absences for certain species in a square degree cell much like an atlas or a national graded survey. So when low precision records are mixed with high precision records, the low precision one group together and raise the count for that combination of coordinates. And that's how this grid is formed. So far I've been using colors to represent density of records, but they can certainly represent other features. We made an experiment and used colors to reflect the provenance of the records. In this map of Europe, each color represents a different data publisher. 
it has nothing to do this time with the density of records, just from what institution the records come from, who is publishing them. And it turns out that when we interpret those colors, this pattern appears. Institutions almost exclusively sample their own countries or local areas. See, for example, light blue points here. These come from a Swedish institution, and they are only found in Sweden. These blue points here, they come from British institutions, and they are only found in Britain. And it's not only a matter of countries. These yellow points here, they come from an institution in Paris, and they only sample Paris and the surroundings. So how do we, now that we have seen uh, some examples of these maps, how do we build them? Well, maps are actually nothing but a special type of scatter plot. Using any spreadsheet with basic mapping capabilities or plotting capabilities, we can build these maps. The only thing that's needed is to be sure that the longitude value goes to the x-axis and the latitude value goes to the y-axis. Here, for example, this is a screenshot of the preparation of the map of the mammals from Kenya without any further processing, just by plotting the records. The only thing left to build our map is to update the limits of the axis, make the y-axis go from 90 to minus 90, and the, the x-axis from 180 to minus 180. Then we fill the background with a picture of the surface of the Earth, and we have built our own map. If we want to add color, we just need to create different series of points, series that will depend on the amount of records, the provenance, or whichever other feature. Now let's move on and see how we can represent time information in a way that makes sense for our purposes. One of the plots I like to use is a radial plot where the angle represents the day of the year and the distance from the center is proportional to the number of records for that particular day. I like this type of plots because they help give in the feeling of a cyclic pattern, which helps seeing time as a continuous motion rather than a limited discrete range. The radial plots can help detect in natural patterns, like when do birds cross a specific location in their migration, but this requires a uniform sampling effort, which is not always the case. More often, this type of plot, together with the next one, will help detecting precisely flaws in sampling events. They, will, they help detecting weird trends in sampling dates. This plot that we call the heptagram helps with that. Instead of using a circular shape, this uses a more table-like approach, where we can put months on one axis here, from 1 to 12. And on the other axis, we can put either day of the week or day of the month. Then we fill the cells with color, which is proportional to the amount of records for that combination. In this first example, we have plotted the day of the week versus the month for the occurrences of a single collection. And we can see the density of color goes, the density of colors represent the density of records from lighter, meaning less records, to darker, meaning more records. And we can see three, three different patterns here. The first one is a general seasonal patterns. We look the summer, spring, summer months are more dense than winter months, for example. This could mean there are more this means that there are more records in summer than in winter, but that could mean that people go sampling on summer rather than winter, or that there actually are more organisms in summer than in winter that can be seen. The second one is definitely a sampling bias. The, if you take a close look, there are more records on Saturday and especially on Sunday than on weekdays, especially during winter. People like to go sampling on weekends rather than weekdays. And the third one is, what's going on here? What's, what's happening on this on the Saturdays of January? This is strange. This, this doesn't look natural to me. There are way too many records for the, Janu for the Saturday of January. So the second type of heptogram, which represents months versus day of months, helps solving this issue. Here, the axes have changed. We have now the months up here 
and we have, we have the day of the month in this other axis. We can still see the seasonal trend. We see months from spring and summer are more dense than winter. We have lost the weekend sampling bias, but we have gained a bit of inf a bit of extra information on the Saturday of January issue. It's actually just a matter of two different days, January 24th and January 26th, which are way more densely represented than the than the other days. This is probably an organized sampling event. This is I re I. I repeat, this is a, uh, these are data from a single collection, and it's probably an organized sampling event where people gathered on a particular day to go sampling an area, and they gather a lot of information for that particular day. Since that it's not repeated the other days of the month, then those two days, Saturday 20, 24 and 26 of January, they get way more records than the rest of the days. <laughs> 